Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, this will be a kind of new topic for you, so I'll just present some basic results on the quantum first uh, detection problem. I assume you all hear me, right? Yes, 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 we hear you. Okay, so as a starter, uh, consider this graph and let us start with a discussion on a classical random walker on such a graph. A very well-known uh, problem and well-investigated is the following question. We have some random walk on this graph and we can ask a question, uh, when you start, let's say at site zero, when will, it, when will the particle first arrive at, let's say site three? And the basic questions are, A, will the particle arrive? When will it arrive? What is the distribution of the times of arrival? Which of course will depend on the dynamics on this graph. Now, in recent years, there has been a lot of interest in the following question. Let us assume that this uh, represents a quantum walker. By quantum walk, I mean a tight binding model, uh, which was introduced two talks ago. So you have hopping amplitudes, let's say, between nearest neighbors, let's say all of them the same. And you want to ask the question, if I start here, when will the particle arrive for the first time in this place? Now, a quantum particle does not have a path. So to define this problem, we need to de define a measurement protocol, uh, which we do uh, soon. But the generic questions are, what are the distribution of times of arrival from or detection from site, one site to another? It could be on a line. It could be on all kinds of various types of graphs, hypercubes, etc. So. To define the, pro the problem uh, more precisely, we define a measurement protocol. So we have this uh, kind of graphs, which represent a quantum rock. Uh, this is a actually a representation of the adjacency matrix describing the jumps between, let's say, nearest neighbors. And initial condition, let's say, is localized on a node, and we want to detect the particle here. So here we have the experimentalist performing measurements. And in this talk, there will be local measurements. And the question will be, uh, this uh, experimentalist is asking, is the particle found at this location? So this is a yes, no question, which we will soon describe by a projection operator. So the experimentalist uh, measures every tau units of time, the first measurement, the second measurement, etc. And then uh, the experimentalist gets a sequence of measurements, no, no, no. And after several measurements, a yes. This yes, the time where, where this yes appears is of course random due to the basic assumptions of measurement theory and quantum mechanics without introducing noise. Um, so uh, the Bayesian uh, question was introduced in the concept of quantum search algorithm and the question is, is this quantum search superior to the classical walk in the point of view of fast detection? How do we choose tau? Tau is the time between measurements. Uh, of course, if tau is too small, this is not good because then you will have Zeno effect, which will freeze the dynamics and then the detection will be unlikely. There is therefore some optimal uh, sampling. And this was introduced by many, several groups. Uh, I list a few. And you'll hear a second talk by Abhishek Dar later on in this conference. So here I'll just focus on some basic things. So again, we get a string of no, 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 and eventually a yes in the end entry and n times tau is the random first detection event. And what is non-trivial is that the measurement processes collapses the wave function sets on the node that we are detecting the wave function to be zero after each measurement. And then the combination of measurements and uh, unitary evolution between measurements give you a non-Hermitian description of this type of problem. In the operator language, we project out a, a, the XM component of the stakes function when we do not detect the particle, so the measurements influence. Now, the basic uh, working horse that we uh, use to solve these type of problems, a very general equation called the quantum renewal equation, but I assume you don't know much about this field, so let me first introduce a classical first passage time problem. So a well-known co concept, uh, consider a random walk, a Markovian in space, let's say on the lattice or Brownian motion, if you want. 
Then uh, let us consider the following question. What is the probability of going from some initial position to some initial, uh, to do some final state from X1 to X2? This is of course the green function. Let's say it's the Gaussian propagator that you, you know from Brownian motion. Now, if you look at this path, you can decompose it into two. Uh, th this is the, uh, the, 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 the path in some measurement time T, but to go from here to here, you first have to go from the initial condition to the final state for the first time at some previous time, and then you need to create a loop. So in short, by if you know the probability to go from X1 to X2 at some time T, from this, you can decompose the path to go in a previous time, and then you can decompose in a loop. And we are interested in the distribution of the first passage time. So the bottom line here is that these two uh, problems, the return problem and the uh, Gaussian propagator are related. And we could show that for the model under investigation, there is a similar relation. So first of all, in the quantum problem, there is a very a key concept, which is similar to, I would say, the wave function in some sense. And this is phi n. It's the amplitude of the first detection. Uh, what is the meaning of this? Fn is the square of this amplitude, is the probability of the first detection in the nth attempt. So phi f1 is the probability to detect in the first attempt, f2 in the second attempt, et cetera, et cetera. To so the goal of the theory is to find these phi ends. And this is given by this renewal equation, which is similar to what I just showed you, but instead of considering uh, probabilities, now we are considering amplitude. So we are just doing what Feynman taught us in quantum mechanics, replace probabilities with amplitudes. So starting with some initial condition, you have a unitary evolution to XM. That's the probability to go from some starting point to some final state, some node. This is the same as uh, going uh, in from the, the, uh, the, the first, you have some detection at some uh, first detection at some previous time and then going in the loop again from XM and back to XM. So this equation uh, we analyze, and this is of course a convolution equation. So we use this uh, kind of convolutions, but I'm not going to go into the math of this uh, uh, so much. But if you look at this uh, more carefully, then phi one, the probability to detect in the first attempt is simply the initial condition unitary evolution. And then you uh, collapse the wave function XM. This is what is taught in every course in quantum mechanics. While phi two is you have the initial condition unitary evolution. Then you have the projection out oh, because of the measurement. This gives the normicity. Then again, a unitary evolution XM, this gives you phi two. So these are these amplitudes that we calculate with this uh, very general tool. So now, now I'm going to present a, a specific problem. And this is a problem in quantum search. Even for finite space, uh, the very small systems or finite dimensional uh, space, Hilbert space, the, the total detection probability can be less than one. The total detection probability is the detection, uh, let's say you measure infinite amount of times, will you detect the particle? For a classical random walk on a finite graph, you always detect the particle after some time because the motion is ergodic, you eventually detect. But in quantum search, uh, you are suboptimal in the sense that sometimes you do not detect the particle. And we want to understand this, uh, 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 which for engineering problems, it's a, it's a problem because you don't find the particle. But from physics point of view, this is simply nice that um, there is something non-trivial on, uh, on, on the eventual detection. So the p-detection is simply the sum of fn's, the probabilities to detect at the first attempt till infinity, or the sum of the amplitude squares. So what is the problem? If you have, a, let us consider a specific example, very simple one. Let's say you have a ring. <laughs> then uh, we detect on this node here, the empty circle. Then if you had a classical random walk, you, no matter where you start, you would detect the particle with probability one, maybe after one attempt, two attempts, whatever, but eventually you detect the particle. In that sense, it's classical search is efficient. On the other hand, in this case, if you start, let's say here, you will detect only with probability half. Let us understand this. Consider an initial condition, which is a linear combination starting in these two symmetric states. 
This is what we call later a bright state. It is detected with probability one due to constructive interference. On the other hand, let's say you start here with a amplitude minus on this side and plus on this side. Here, the wave function will be always zero on the detector. And this is why this is destructive interference. You will never detect the particle if you start here. Now, this initial condition, which is a linear combination of these two, uh, you detect, therefore, with probability, which is less than half. This is what I meant, uh, non-efficient detection in a very simple uh, example. So let us look now on graphs, very simple graphs, but we can uh, make them. I, sorry, I had a question about the previous slide. Uh, so, this, uh, so this is assuming that uh, the underlying uh, model is a tight binding uh, lattice or or is it in general true? Uh, do you need to have some ordered lattice? Yes, so th this fact that this is my, I I'm going to talk about this, but this fact that P detection is uh, not optimal is related to the symmetry of this, the system and to degeneracy. Okay, okay. I'm going to talk about this. Thanks, thanks. It doesn't need to be nearest neighbor hopping, but yes. Um, so let us look at some graphs. And just, uh, I, we, we, I solved here using the renewal equation. I found the total detection probability. The hops to nearest neighbors are all the same. I detect here, so this is the ring. From If I start here, I get probability half, half. If I start from here, I get probability one. Similarly, for the cube from the nearest, three nearest neighbors, the probability is the one set. If you start here, you get one. And, I have, and if you look a little bit on the, all these graphs, you see immediately that symmetry is playing some key role. For example, if I detect here, one over four, one over four, because I have here four uh, nearest neighbors. So obviously symmetry is playing a very uh, important role. Let us understand this. Um, again, we can derive these uh, solutions by the renewal equation, but obviously there is some, something much simpler going on. So to start, let us uh, consider um, uh, an initial condition which is a linear combination of starting the particle on two sides, Ri and Rj on my lattice. And I start with some phase, uh, some general phase, Ei delta between them. From the quantum renewal equation, because it's a linear theory, like everything in quantum mechanics, the amplitude of detecting the particle after n attempts, starting with this very special initial condition, to some side, you can decompose as the two initial conditions starting on Ri or Rj, and the phase is here. Now, if uh, these two states, Rj and Ri, are equivalent with respect to the detector, like there is a symmetry, so these two starting points, which are different, but from the point of view of the detector, they are the same, then the total probability of this uh, auxiliary wave function, Fn, the probability to detect it for the first time, is given by this expression where I can choose either Ri or Rj. Now, the point is that the sum of the probabilities of these starting with this auxiliary initial condition is always less than one. Therefore, I can get this bound uh, that the sum over starting on one of these two initial st states the sum has to be less than one, and here enters the phase. Now I can choose the phase just because I want to, to, to delta equals zero, and then I get the following. If in the system I have two equivalent sites, Ri and Rj, which are the same, the P detection starting on one of them is less than half. So in generally, consider a graph where you have a new initial conditions that are all identical with respect to the detector, the total detection probability from Ri to Xm is one over nu. And so the quantum detection is less efficient if compared to the classical random walk. And symmetry plays here in this simple bound uh, important uh, rule. So for example, we can take, let's say the cube. Again, we can consider hypercube. It doesn't matter, this is in three dimensions. We have our exact value, three nearest neighbors the symmetry bound gives you the same as the exact, so the bound is good. However, if you consider these uh, kind of trees, it's only a bound if you look carefully, these two numbers are not the same. So um, we can, uh, of course, find also exact uh, expression for p-detection. 
exact expression is not a bound, it's based on the analysis of the bright and dark states. And this, uh, okay, for you guys, you just look at it for a second, it's a pretty horrible equ equation. For me, this is a beautiful equation. It connects between uh, the eigenvalues of the system, the, of, of the Hermitian Hamiltonian, the detection site XM and the initial condition. And you need to know all these sites. And in, in, in here, you need to sum over the degeneracies GL. Now, the point is, if you look carefully on this, on this formula, if in the system, you have no degeneracy, then the detection probability is unity. Uh, this is a, a one amazing thing here, that this order that removes the symmetry actually helps you detect the particle. It helps you detect the particle with probability one. The whole philosophy of Anderson localization that this order is not good for search is in some sense not correct. It's correct in the sense of time. But if you look at the detection probability, if you want to optimize that, you want that to be one, some small disorder is actually helping you detect the particle because you kill these uh, dark states. This is an insight, I can talk about this later, was also re revealed before us by Plenio in the context of light harvesting systems. Yeah. So it seems that nature knows about this for uh, yeah. thousands of years. Yes? Excuse me? I cannot hear you, sir. How much? How much? Uh, sorry, I think there is some background. Uh, there's some background uh, uh, noise. I uh, yeah. Now it's fine. I think uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't think there was a question. I don't think there was a question. Yeah. Please proceed. Okay. The, the other thing that you see from this equation that the detection probability is tau independent. It doesn't matter what is tau. Uh, and again, this is pretty, pretty magnificent. Um, so you can choose any tau, the detection probability is independent of that. And we could show that it is valid beyond this troposcopic protocol. So how much time do I have now? Manush, uh, when uh, it was started, uh, uh, it's fine. I mean, you can, you can, you can, um, uh, maybe ten minutes. Okay. Yeah. So I want to go a little bit deeper into this issue of these dark and bright states. So, uh, generally speaking, the Hilbert space under these repeated measurements is divided into two parts: a dark and a bright space. So I denote it symbolically: bright and dark. Uh, this is related to something called Zeno subspaces. So in, in some sense, you know this in the limit, if you know the Zeno effect, uh, in the limit of tau equals zero. If you think about some graph and you take the measurement time to be very, very, very small, very quick measurements, then if you start in one of these dark spots and you detect here, you know that you cannot reach this point. The, Zeno limit uh, freezes out. So all these uh, initial conditions are dark. You never detect the particle here. And then some part of the Hilbert space, or this is a spatial, if you want to think about like this, these states are dark. They are never detected in this limit. On the other hand, if you start here and measure here, of course you detect the particle. So if then uh, you see that the, the system in the Zeno limit is divided into bright and dark. Uh, this is the bright state where you detect and dark state. Much more profound is that this division into two types uh, of states, bright and dark and only bright and dark is found generically, not because of fast measurements, but because of interference. So a system, if it has some symmetry, but tau is not small. The measurement time between measurements is not small, is also divided in two types of states, those that cannot be detected never, and those that are detected with probability one. And this is like ergodicity breaking that some states you can detect and some states you cannot. And this is what is behind uh, this uh, type of suboptimal sub uh, uh, detection. So let us understand this a little bit more, these bright and dark states 
Um, so a bright state is detected with probability one and a dark state is detected with probability zero. And the Hilbert space can be decomposed into these two dark and bright subspaces, provided that the system, the Hilbert space itself is finite. Um, if you have an infinite system, it's a different story. Uh, for upper measurement, this is related to the Zeno effect. But again, we don't want to work in the Zeno limit. Dark states are generically related to degeneracy and hence to symmetry. We already saw this, that symmetry is important. And what, what is the reason here? So we can, uh, let's assume that we have some uh, uh, two degenerate uh, uh, energy levels, E1 and E2. The, some generic ones, they have the same um, states. Then I can take this state and I can define a linear combination of E1 and E2 with these amplitudes here, Xm, Xm again is where you detect the particle. And here you have Xm E1, Xm E2. It's very easy to understand because these two states have the same energy that for any time, the amplitude on the detector is going to be zero because the evolution here is just a phase, the usual phase, exponential I energy times time. And again, these two, time, two, two energies are the same energy they, they are degenerate by definition. And then if you start in this state, it's dark, it's never detected. So you see here that degeneracy gives you dark states. And this is related, of course, to the symmetry that we saw before. In principle, also a non-degenerate energy level can be dark if uh, this energy level has Xm E3, then if you start in this state, of course, you'll never detect it. And different people have considered this uh, type of uh, dark states in the past. We are not the first to consider this. I list uh, a few, uh, starting from uh, Zeno physics and more recent work uh, on these uh, dark states. So, <clears throat> What is happening here? Um, let's say we have a generic uh, energy state, some system with some energy levels, and you have degeneracy. This is the degeneracy of this state. This state has a degeneracy one, this has five, eight, five, seven, one, etc. My claim is that um, this, uh, and assume that all the, the, the energy states have finite overlap with the detector for simplicity. So the claim is that if you have no degeneracy, you have one bright state. This state is detected. If you start here, you detect with probability one and there's no dark state here. If you have five at degeneracy five, then you have one bright state and four dark states, etc. So this is the decomposition. decomposition. The more disorder you have, the more dark state, excuse me, the, more, the higher the degeneracy, the larger is the number of the dark states. Uh, with, with this type of classification, we are able to reach our main result for the p-detection in terms of the eigenstates. Because if we know all the dark states, then we can say what is the probability of the detection depending on the initial condition. So um, th th this is the way of analysis. I'm not going here into the detail, but from a, a, like I showed you before, where I construct from a linear combination of two energy states, degenerate energies, a dark state, I can continue in this with the gram schmidt type of procedure and find all the dark states in the submanifold. And when I, once I have all the dark states, then I can find the detection probability. And that goes back to the equation that we had before, uh, which I gave you here. So this is how we get to this equation. I'm not going here into the details. So again, now we had already a bound from above, which was very simple. We, ju we just need to count the number of equivalent states with respect to the detector and we have a bound. But we found that there is another bound, uh, which is a lower bound for the P detection. And this is a, an uncertainty-like relation. I'm just going to give you the final result. And if you're interested, you can go to my papers and read. And the uncertainty principle reads like the following. We define a delta P. Delta P is the deviation of the detection probability from the initial overlap with the detector. So this is delta P. It depends on the initial uh, condition. 
then we need to calculate the variance of H, but not the variance of H in general, but in the measurement state. So these are the fluctuation of energy in the, in the, the measurement state. And then you need, a, like in other type of, uh, of um, uh, uncertainty relations, you, you, these are always related to some commutation. So this is the commutation relation of H and D. D is the projection, which is describing the measurements. And this, you, you calculate this matrix element between the initial state and the final state. What is the final state is where you eventually detect the particle after many uh, attempts, XM. So if you know these matrix elements, you have a lower bound to P detection. So uh, again, here it's a, a connection between the initial and final state because during the measurement, you are changing the wave function. And this gives you a lower bound. And I'll just show you a few examples uh, about this lower bound. So if let's say we consider this uh, ring, the uncertainty principle gives the lower bound half and half, uh, half and half, which is exactly like the exact value. Uh, the lower bound here from the uncertainty principle is a little bit far from the exact result. But still, you see that this lower bound together with the upper bound, which is due to symmetry, at least for small systems, it's very useful. And without working hard, without uh, finding out all the energy levels of the system, all the states of the system, which are needed for the exact formula, we can uh, find these bounds and we can understand the system. And in that sense, we have understood a little bit more on the detection probability. Uh, I would like to just mention that this, this is just the tip of the iceberg because there are many different types of questions like the first passage time. Here I just talked about the detection probability. We can talk on finite systems. We can talk about large systems, disordered systems, the fluctuations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, all this is also related to non-emission Hamiltonian systems. Uh, you can see this in the last uh, part where we replace the measurement, instead of doing these strong measurements, we replace it with a non-emission uh, non leakage out of the system. This was also promoted by Abhishek Da, who will again give a talk about this issue, I think tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. I want to thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, thank you, Eli. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for the nice talk. Um, are there any questions? Uh, please feel free to unmute and ask the questions. Uh, hi, Eli. Uh, so, I, uh, so I had a question on this uh, uh, uncertainty uh, relation. I mean, so I mean, just I'm just trying to understand it uh, a bit physically. I mean, can one interpret it some sort of a, like time uh, energy uncertainty, like the time of detection? And can one think of it? Well, um, there are several answers. We also have a second type of uh, uncertainty relation which uh, relates to time. And that is when you look at the average time till you detect, but I didn't look at this problem here, right? I didn't look at the time till the first click happened. Let's assume you do find the particle. There is a fluctuation in the time right. of first detection and this we showed is related to an uncertainty principle. And so instead of Delta P here, you have the uh, fluctuation of time of arrival. And then instead of the variance of H, you have the, 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 the difference between the upper energy, the E max and the E min in the, in the system. So the first answer is that there is a second uh, uncertainty principle, but it's not this one because this one is related to the detection probability. Uh, to, so to talk about this one uh, specifically, uh, I would say this is different than the usual uh, time uh, energy uncertainty principle because those are related to one shot measurements. You, you evolve your system yeah. and you do, let's say, perturbation, then you measure one time. Here, the, all along the, pr the process, you have many measurements. So it's a, this a combination of unitaries and detections, unitary and detections. And that's why you start in some initial condition, you end in a different initial condition. You don't conserve energy in the process. 
uh, because you have many measurements. So I, I believe this is different than the usual type of uh, uncertainty principles, uh, simply because the, there is no unitaries and uh, you have many detections and also the observables are different. But again, you see something similar because you have this uh, commutation relation. So I call this uncertainty-like relations, uh, which are of course inspired by those famous relations, but they're not exactly the same. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, so uh, okay, so maybe I have just one question. So maybe it's a, probably it's a very uh, naive question, but I, uh, if I understood you correctly, so if you uh, if you have a highly disordered system, uh, then and it, say say it is Anderson localized or many body localized, uh, let's say, now, then it is. Uh, you said that it is a bit counterintuitive that uh, you still have detection probability, right? So can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Uh, maybe I misunderstood, but uh, naively I would think that uh, things will just get localized and it will be almost, uh, you know, the detection probability is low, but you're saying it's somewhat opposite, right? Yes. Uh, I'm saying this, and again, Plenio said it in the context of light harvesting systems with non-emission dynamics. It's not exactly new. Okay, so is there a physical way to understand why it yes. has... Yeah. There, are, there are two different issues. One is, will you detect the particle at all? Mm -hmm. That's question number one. The second question is, how long, if you detect the particle, how long will it take you to detect? Right, 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 right. And Anderson localization apparently will tell you that, first of all, you will detect the, the particle with probability one, but it will take you a very long time, exponentially long. Right, right. So uh, it, 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 the question is, what do you optimize? You want to optimize your success, eventual success Mm -hmm. or you want to in, uh, optimize the time for success. It's like if you want to meet, let's say, your lady, you can ask, will I at all meet, meet some guy or lady or whatever? Or when will I meet it? And these are very different questions. Right. Right. Now, in the context of this search problem, we have a kind of problem in the quantum search community because we actually want to optimize both. So if you add a, a little bit of disorder, it's bad in the sense of the time, yes. but it's good in the sense of the detection. I see. I see. So, uh, for example, uh, in light harvesting systems, according to Plenio, the nature build these light harvesting systems with a little bit of disorder in order to promote the detection, but not the disorder cannot be too strong in order to have Landerson localization. So there is a very subtle balance here. I see, I see, I see. Okay, okay. But it's not trivial. I mean, yes, many people are surprised. Oh, disorder is something very bad, yeah. but it's not always bad. Right, right. Thanks, thanks. Um, okay, so, uh, okay, so I guess uh, if there are no other questions, uh, thank you, Eli, for the nice talk.